Hello everyone. The next three theorists, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Hayward Simmel, and W.E.B. Du Bois, are extensions of what is relevant theory. Why are these important? Each of these theorists did not, as did Marx or Weber or Durkheim, attempt to develop some unified general theory of social life that would explain all human social processes. They are, however, still relevant. Theory is not a dead topic, but one in which some theories fall out of favor as systematic explanatory narratives, and others, initially overlooked in their own time, become relevant. They receive a second look and become relevant considering new information and new approaches to analyzing and explaining social phenomena. Charlotte Perkins Gilman is important in that she was the first social thinker to develop a comprehensive theory of gender as explicitly tied to economic arrangements. Friedrich Engels had tried, but his work was more of a general description of how economic arrangements benefited the capital system than there were an explicit analysis of processes associated with gender. Gilman's two central concepts, gender inequality and women in the economy, were prescient in that they were at the dawn of the 20th century the first works to address the completely overlooked reality of the value of women's work in the household. Gilman argued that the work that women did in the household was devalued, and that there was no consideration of the economic value of women's work. Think, for example, how much you would have to pay someone to cook, to clean your house, and most important, to raise your children. This was her point, six decades before second wave feminism would take up a systematic analysis of these concepts. While she recognized that there were indeed biological sex distinctions, we would call them gender distinctions in the 21st century, she saw that these were used to subjugate women to a role ancillary to men. The women could not, for example, participate fully in intellectual, political, or other spheres of public life. This insight led Gilman to the conclusion that men and women were treated unequally in relation to their positions in the economic structure of work. Our next theorist we are exploring is Georg Simmel. Simmel introduced some powerful ideas to the analysis of the social world. First, his form versus content distinction provides a powerful tool through which to clarify just exactly what we are explaining using social science methods. Simmel thought that society and individuals had a recursive relationship, that is, one works on the other. As society works down or exerts power and influence on the individual, but individuals simultaneously are not completely engulfed by their association with society or with a group. People have to, in order to survive, 
maintain some sense of their individuality. For Simmel, the question is, how is this duality analyzed? The way to do this for Simmel is through making a distinction between what he termed form and content. Simmel sought to analyze the forms versus the actual content. What does this mean? Let's look at an example. A sociologist of religion might examine a series of faith-based religious organizations and sects. They're not concerned about at all whether or not these are true. They're not making a value. They're concerned about how they function. What are the statuses within religious organizations? The degree to which they access central writings or scriptures? The degree to which rituals are used to establish what is sacred? Here's another example. Everywhere there are employer-employee relationships. For Simmel, he's looking at the forms of these interactions, not specific content. So for Simmel, the tension was between social conventions an individual summoning their own sense of self and what forms in interactions. Simmel employed this thinking when he analyzed the money economy. In a society, a dollar bill, for example, has the same value regardless of its holding it. Money can be used as a means of exchange for anything. Food, rent, a means of investing to generate more money, pleasure, movies, internet pornography, anything you wish. Money meets our basic needs and luxuries, and we become less interdependent on other people. Money is impersonal. It is fungible. My dollar bill has the same purchasing power as does yours. You can take it to the dollar bill menu at Wendy's. I can take it to the dollar bill menu at McDonald's. Finally, Simmel developed a central organizing concept that we can use to compare his social assessments with those of others. The concepts of the other is an important one. For Simmel, the form of human interaction can be grouped in what he calls archetypes. Every society was composed of 12 ideal types of humans, merchants, spiritual leaders, etc. But one type of other that Simmel focused on was that of the outsider. For Simmel, being a Jewish intellectual in an anti-Semitic environment, informed his work. The others in the society simultaneously lived in the society but were systematically excluded from it. Others then in European society were Jews, the minority Romani, also known as Gypsies, and the nations of Europe. These very same groups were excluded to some degree from the full rights and economic benefits of citizenship property ownership, and political participation. The cataclysmic conclusion of this exclusion, of course, results in groups of people being targeted in the Holocaust in World War II. Simmel's concept of the other and the form, not specific content, that this takes allows for comparisons with other similar forms in other societies, particularly institutionalized racism a structural, society-wide component present in the United States. For example, it also gives us the baseline from which to compare any subordinate, unequal relationship between categories of people, including gender, sexuality, and ethnicity in terms of inequality. Bringing this concept of the other into Simmel's focus on form, we see that form, the pattern of the other in relation to dominant groups, allows for a comparison with other forms of inequality in other societies, particularly the United States, where, simultaneously to Simmel and the formulation of his theories, the American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois was making history. Du Bois was the first African American to receive a Ph.D. from Harvard University and the founder of the NAACP. He was ignored by other sociologists of the day. He articulated the framework, however, through which to examine what Henry Louis Gates terms a central trope or narrative that is still of enormous importance, that of race and race relations between categories of people. In his groundbreaking work, The Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois outlines what he considers to be a central problem in the United States, what he terms the color line. 
On one side of this color line is the dominant group. On the other, non-whites, at the time the salient group for Du Bois was African Americans, but this can apply to any non-white group. He asserted that people of color must, to survive, have a double consciousness. That is, people of color must always not only be self-aware, but also aware of any forces or interactions that might come at them from individuals and institutional effects of a dominant white culture. Think about this. It's as true in 2017 as it was in 1902 when he wrote it. In your personal experiencing, how often are you tasked with thinking about your race as a subjective reality? For some of us in the right circumstances, the answer might be not at all. As a white, middle-aged man, I rarely have ever am made aware or forced to think about in an everyday environment this fact, the fact that I'm a white man. For my friends of color, however, they tell me a different story. So, Du Bois' theory of race, the color line, becomes penultimately relevant to us today in 2017, 125 years after it was written.